Next up, we have a we have a session called Charting a Confidential Course Navigating the AI Frontier. Uh, confidentiality matters to me. I hope it matters to you. To tell us about it is Dr. Marcus Liebricht from Intel. Please welcome Marcus. Welcome and a very good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having Intel again here on stage. This talk is somewhat of a, an extension of the narrative that my colleague Stefan Gillich yesterday in his keynote started. But while he was talking about mostly of the um, challenge, sorry, the uh, opportunities of AI, I want to focus specifically on the challenges around security, privacy in the context of AI-based regulation. But before we do that, let's rewind back a little bit. So, if you haven't been living under a rock, you know how much AI is supposed to transform our lives, our businesses. And by that, it's sort of an extension of the uh, somewhat, by now, mature paradigm of big data uh, and analytics of activating a value in data that so far couldn't be activated, couldn't be used. This happens in very diverse fields. Um, and you, you can grow revenue in advertising by indeed activating that data that already is being collected, whether we like it or not, but uh, this is a, a, a massive field there. In other areas, such as, such, uh, as, as uh, weather forecasts, for example, uh, you can utilize AI to reduce the processing power of weather forecasts massively uh, versus the existing numerical simulation. Also reducing costs as possible in procurement in order to navigate complex configuration questions that otherwise would require a lot of time or processing power uh, indeed as well. And lastly, um, if you think of your ubiquitous chatbot in support, or if you think of the use of power tools for um, creatives, by using AI plugins in there, your Photoshop, your digital audio workstations. This is a, an area where we can accelerate processes work for us all. So it's clear AI drives forward in terms of innovation. AI drives forward in terms of uh, its business impetus. But is that, is that all? Well, clearly, um, nation states have realized that uh, AI is also put a potential that can harm societies, can harm individuals. And so uh, the European Union, as well as the United States, have both set out, among others, to rein in this potentially harmful uh, application area of, of artificial intelligence. In the EU, it's the AI Act. You may have heard that it's been ratified uh, quite recently. And in the US, it's the executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI that has been uh, uh, crafted in order to layer on top of existing privacy and security regulations. So um, with that in mind, uh, we, we got to ask ourselves, is this, is this really a conflicting uh, trend on the other side that will <laughs> Uh, successfully reined it in? Is this a, uh, basically a clash that is going to occur here? Are we on a collision course, as this slide says, and will we, will we be able to reconcile it in the way that we uh, invent, engineer, architect our AI platforms and services? Well, for that, let's have a quick look at the European Union's AI Act, which usually applies to most of us here uh, in a little bit more detail. The AI Act uh, starts by setting out to uh, frame uh, the application of AI systems in different risk categories. As you see here in this pyramid, it starts on the top with systems that are simply unacceptable and therefore forbidden. These systems of the use of AI, they set out to harm individuals, harm society, and uh, uh, for example, often cited in this category for social scoring systems which go against European um, human values. Underneath there is the first category where we can actually do some useful things with. It's the high-risk category, and 
It's called high risk because it can, it can still harm individuals and society if applied not in the right manner. These uh, concern sectors that are anyway safety uh, related. Transportation comes to mind, medical uh, systems come to mind, or for that matter, uh, even toys come to mind in this case. Also, critical infrastructure falls into this case because it's critical for the functioning of businesses and societies, and whether it's a physical critical infrastructure, energy, for example, or it's virtual critical infrastructure such as migration management. They fall into this category. Third layer is really the broad layer of limited risk systems. And this is uh, a, a, an area where it's possible to de-risk the systems by simply being transparent about it. So if you think of deepfakes or chatbots, again, uh, they can be easily de-risked by simply stating this, here's an AI system uh, in operation, and it can help you um, uh, to judge as a human the output of these AI systems. So broad category, um, somewhat uh, um, guarded by transparency obligations. And lastly, there's a, a broad area of AI systems that have minimal or no risk, and they are enough to be regula uh, regulated by existing forms of regulation, such as GDPR, for example, or other sector-specific regulations. Think of uh, HIPAA for uh, healthcare in the United States. So, if that is, uh, if we look at that, then we'll have to say, okay, uh, where do we fall into this category with our technical implementations? And um, for that, let's have a quick look at this slide that you see here on, uh, behind, on the back uh, of, of the big screen. Um, it is a classification that was done by Stanford University of the uh, then current uh, selection of representative foundational models being used in all of these layers, actually. So this is a technical uh, uh, look at compliance of large language models or foundational models in this case um, towards uh, a set of um, parameters, a set of uh, requirements coming out of the uh, EU AI Act in this case uh, and uh, mapping what these models are actually able to provide in terms of assurances there. What we can see is, uh, just from the number of black and uh, hollow dots here on, the, uh, on this chart, is none of the models back then, and I would think still to a degree by now, even if they have evolved since then, uh, managed to be complied in, all, in each of the cases of, of what is being brought up by regulations such as the AI Act. So that's, that's natural because it's it takes a while in order to uh, create these controls that are necessary. Um, and therefore, it's also reasonable that uh, while the legislation is there uh, with the AI Act, it only goes into effect in, um, I think it's two years from now. So, this is a, a technical way of looking at various requirements that uh, well, we, well, we surely have to do some things about it, be it uh, uh, carbon neutrality, be it, uh, what does what it say here, uh, other risks and mitigations, uh, for the way how it's be, or they're being tested, etc. But there's one area, one particular area that is the core of my talk here, namely security and privacy, where actually the existing regulations and the existing controls that we have can actually work in the very same direction. And that's what we like to call confidential artificial intelligence, confidential AI. What is it? Well, it means that you are by uh, technical means, by hardware supported security controls, make sure that data while being processed within a, an AI model stays confidential throughout the whole life cycle of the data. And by its nature, it's just an overlay, if you want to call it like that, an overlay of the technologies of artificial intelligence, so machine learning, deep learning, generative AI, which is basically just programs with data, uh, and the technology called confidential computing, which I talked about last year here on this stage as well. Confidential computing works by taking this code and its valuable data and putting it into a so-called trusted execution environment. 
A trusted execution environment in this case is an area of memory that is encrypted and stays encrypted even when read into the processor. And only inside the processor, it actually gets decrypted and executed at native speed. Throughout the whole um, chain of events from storage to transport to processing, data stays encrypted with the keys uh, managed uh, independently by the processor are not uh, to be uh, accessed even by the, uh, by the cloud provider. So you get a very clear separation of responsibilities in the, uh, in the accessibility, in the confidentiality of data. We've gone to market with this, which provides data protection in use versus, as I said, data protection at rest and data protection um, in transit. Um, at the, on the market by introducing Intel's Software Guard extensions, or SGX, into 2018. This technology encapsulates a single application, very shrink-wrapped into such a trusted execution environment, uh, at, uh, giving a very small attack surface and making it easy to cryptographically prove um, the, the content. And then we also introduced into Trust Domain extensions a technology that takes a whole virtual machine and puts it into a trusted execution environment last year, uh, making it a lot simpler to utilize confidential computing with uh, some other properties uh, at deployment time. Both of these technologies, as I said, they provide data protection news, but we equally uh, typically say that uh, confidential computing is strong whenever you can provide attestation, and that is a core feature that comes with Intel's confidential computing technologies as well. Attestation means you prove what's inside the TEE. You also prove to an outside relying party what is in the platform. So basically that you have this, uh, the correct patch level of the infrastructure underneath and can do both of that combined in a uh, audit provable way so that uh, it can't be argued uh, afterwards. So confidential computing, uh, I just state it's, it's helping us uh, in, the, in regulation, but I think I should prove that to a degree. So mapping that to actual statements in, the, uh, uh, in, in these two regulations that I called out, the AI Act and the executive order, uh, you see here on the left-hand side some of the requirements. And to just summarize them so that you don't have to read them, the left-hand side talks about resilience and protection of the underlying system on which, uh, on which AI runs. The second bullet talks about resilience and protection of the model uh, that is being used with its data, with its inputs and outputs, and its weights, for example. And th these two points, they seem to almost be made for confidential computing, which really strengthens all of these points through hardware-based mechanisms. Now, uh, the last one, actually, if you, if you read that, it calls out so-called privacy-enhancing technologies, and that's a quote from uh, the uh, executive order in this case. And this requirement of privacy-enhancing uh, technologies uh, is basically a direct nod to technologies like confidential computing. It's the umbrella term for it. There are others that work in this, uh, this domain as well, but I'd argue that confidential computing is both the fastest, the most mature on the market, and the most uh, universally applicable uh, technology in this domain. So, now, but what if you don't have regulatory requirements? So if you fall basically under this uh, bottom low risk or minimal risk category, and it's, it's here really that uh, confidential AI can also be beneficial to you because it rarely is the case that you're not working alone on data, so you may have needs in a multi-party setting uh, to keep governance domains completely separate. So sharing, or, sorry, combining data from different parties, from different governance domains, without sharing it with each other. Sounds a little bit uh, weird, but it's basically what you're doing here by uh, all of these three parties here on the left-hand side combining their data in, a, in an encrypted way inside this trusted execution environment that then acts basically as a, as a computational vault in which computation happens and a result from which all participate can be generated. 
but none of the participants are exposing their data to each other in this case. And it's protected from the hosting environment as well. So that's a side effect on this. Privacy and IP protection is along the similar uh, design pattern. And so if you have commercial IP that needs to be handled carefully, that cannot be um, combined easily with, with other things, that can be helped by confidential computing. Also, um, if you just want to hide processes from plain sight, there are often um, fairly elaborate um, processes to be done on anonymization and tokenization that in some cases you can actually avoid by just putting the processing of them behind this protected, this opaque wall of the trusted execution environment. So here in this case, you could save the, uh, the, the steps of token creation and token interpretation afterwards in order to get to the result by just working on the plain text data inside a protected environment that cannot be accessed from the outside. And last but not least, uh, under stronger security, it's just a fantastic way of defense in depth measure uh, when using confidential computing for your artifacts because it's hardened against uh, what you see there as potential cybersecurity threats. So, there's two types of that in uh, technology wise, two types of confidential AI uh, infrastructure. And on the left-hand side here, the, the plain thing that you would think of as well, the way I've introduced it so far, is actually uh, just using your CPU uh, to compute your AI models. You might argue, hey, this doesn't go get me very far, but actually that is not true these days. Um, there's a number of uh, good public presentations as well as performance results out there that will tell you that with the built-in uh, acceleration that our Xeon processors, for example, bring, our advanced matrix extensions, for example, that are enabled for the most common frameworks in AI, you actually have a very good starting point for scaled inference for uh, most of your uh, AI needs when you get started or when you go into production and want to basically maintain the goodness of cloud by horizontal scaling, when you want to have a ubiquity of uh, resources available, etc. So this may well be good enough for you and uh, we'll come to that in a moment. There is also the example of running confidential AI together with accelerators naturally. So, uh, no arguing there. There's uh, the big training tasks on large language models. There's uh, some other refinement tasks that need to be done with GPUs, with external accelerators that at the moment cannot be done easily uh, just with a CPU. So, when you do, do want to do that uh, in a uh, confidential way, it's actually something that is doable, but is a little bit more complex, as you see on the picture here. You don't not only have that encrypted trust execution environment on the CPU, you need the same on the GPU, which works as a multi-tenant device there as well, and you need to have a trusted and confidential way of communicating. Volgo, you have to have an encrypted communication layer on the PCI eBus in this case. What that means is, since that is at the moment uh, only possible via software encryption and device drivers, that's a somewhat limiting factor. Um, we're also working on a technology that we've introduced called TDX Connect that would take this over at line speed so you can run trusted and encrypted communications over the I.O. links at line speed. That'll come in one of our next generations. Uh, and we're working actually on both of these aspects together with the market leaders. So uh, you see uh, NVIDIA mentioned here, it is possible to do that today uh, in the circumstances where it makes sense. But I want to actually uh, go back to the left-hand side here for a moment and like to introduce a guest here for me on stage who will show you a practical example of Xeon inference uh, being used in these circumstances. So, Please welcome with me on stage uh, Bruno Grider from uh, Cosmian. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you. So what Cosmian does is basically data protection in the cloud. So we work with large companies, banks, smaller companies, and we make sure that when they deploy in the cloud, actually data stay protected from their point of view, right? So. 
let me explain how much confidential computing is important to that setting. But first, let me rewind back a little bit and explain how we secure applications in the cloud today. Uh, the basic principle is to use client-side encryption. So, and I'm going to take a, a very common application, which is Google Workspace. Uh, the, same, uh, the same can be said with Office, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, which has an extension called double key encryption. So it exactly works the same. And the basic principle is this. Data is in clear text only on the user side. It's never in, it's never in clear text on the server side. So the way it works is basically you edit data using your doc application or your Word application, and then when client-side encryption or double key encryption for Microsoft is activated, what will happen is that your application will generate an ephemeral key on the fly, and then it will encrypt this data with this ephemeral key. Right. And then there will be a call to a key management system to encrypt, we say wrap, the key with your key on the user side that you control as a customer of the application. And you basically push the encrypted data, so under the yellow key here on, the, on this scheme, and also the encrypted yellow key under the green key, so the wrap key, also to the application provider. Obviously, Google or Microsoft in 365 can't decrypt because they don't know how to unwrap the yellow key, and since they can't decrypt the yellow key, they can't decrypt the document. Now, to do this as a customer, you must have a key MS, a key management system, which is able to do that wrapping and unwrapping. So you could use, for instance, our KMS, Cosmian KMS, which has uh, the API with Google Workspace and uh, Microsoft DKE. But where it becomes really interesting is that thanks to confidential computing, you can actually run the KMS on the cloud side. So you, you don't even have to use client-side encryption. You don't even have to use deploy anything on-premise, which is the interesting part. You can actually protect your key management system on the uh, cloud side. So we need to add a few additional protection to uh, what uh, some uh, computers like Intel TDX provides. And we need to add verifiability to this, because as a customer, as a user of the application, you want to be able to verify at any time that the hardware is correct, the boot sequence uh, on the machine which is running the KMS is correct, and that in that machine, only the KMS is running and it's not been tempered with, there is no malware running. So, we add, we have something called the Cosmian VM, which runs on these machines, and which will provide hardening and that verifiability on it. So that's the client-side encryption part, right? So uh, to recap, you encrypt document on the client side, always only decrypt on the client side. Clear text is always on the client side, but you can run, thanks to confidential computing, your KMS on the cloud side. And so since it's on the cloud side, it can be offered as yes, and you can just basically push a button and it will spawn everything for you, which is really nice. Now, coming to the bottom part of the graph and talking a little bit of, about generative AI, sometimes you want to do stuff with the data on the cloud side. So uh, you want to be able to, for instance, run a model for translation, uh, for summarization. And this is where confidential computing comes in and confidential AI kicks in actually as well. So what will happen there is you basically run a, an AI runner. So we have one as well uh, out of the box that will run again in a confidential uh, VM on top of a confidential machine. And then basically you will establish a TLS connection from the user side all the way to that machine, to that application running on the server. So the TLS connection terminates inside encrypted memory. So it's not visible by the cloud provider. And then you push your document through that TLS connection, perform the computation, and then return the result through that same TLS connection. And that is secure, no problem. So a lot of talks, uh, that's nice for architects, but how does it look like for users? So let me show you. So this is a video of uh, Google. Uh, uh, actually, it's, uh, this is in production. So you've seen Google Drive. You can basically have encrypted and non-encrypted document. And when you click on an encrypted document, uh, basically behind the scene, it's almost transparent to the user. It's completely seamless. Uh, you will get the document, so the key wrap and the document decrypting in your browser. Now, on the right side, there is a plugin which basically talks to an AI runner. And when you want to do a summary, a confidential summary of that document, you basically will just pick up 
the, the actual text on the left side in the browser and send it through the TLS connection to the confidential AI runner running on the right side. So that's a way of both having the best of all security, client-side encryption, and still being able to run things like AI on the server side. That's what, that works already today. That's uh, basically in production. This is something we developed with Google uh, because uh, to ease and facilitate the people taking uh, clients encryption. Again, same thing available with Microsoft DKE. You can do something with Microsoft Windows clients today, protecting Microsoft 365. So this is a recap slide, and just to open a little bit and uh, come back to what Marcus was saying about the future there. So client-side encryption, uh, we've talked about it. Basically, you wrap a KMS uh, inside the confidential VM in the Cosmian VM uh, on the server side, and you're good to go. So that's, that's good. Uh, on the AI side, so what we can do today uh, in uh, production is basically running models, uh, which will do summary or translation on the fly. You've seen it running just before. That was a real-time video, no cheating. Uh, so we can do this, and uh, thanks to Intel TDX technology, the latest Sapphire Rapids machines have something called the AMX extension. Basically, what these extensions do, they do matrix multiplication, and matrix multiplication is exactly what you need when you want to run these models. So on TDX, uh, the translation models and the summary models uh, are basically one billion parameters, roughly, something like this. Uh, they are specialized, they work very well, uh, they have been used, they are open source, they have been used uh, for a long time, and you will get absolutely great performance on pure CPU, thanks to the AMS, uh, basically, uh, extension, which basically speeds up uh, the computation by two to three times. So that, that you can run today in production, perfectly fine, multi-user, concurrent users, on pure CPU, so it's cheap, actually. Uh, the next uh, frontier uh, will be to do more, uh, and uh, especially stuff like uh, RAGS. So RAGS is basically the hybridization of a vector database with an LLM, so you stuff your um, uh, actual data, uh, say your R&D documents on the LLM, so it's a vector DB usually, and uh, then you query the vector DB to pull uh, documents, and then you ask the LLM basically to rearrange the results of the vector DB. The big advantage there is that it doesn't hallucinate. It gives you real data because this is data which is pulled from the... You don't ask the LLM to, go to invent data. You just ask the LLM to reorganize whatever has been delivered to you. And then it can work in multiple languages and so on. So this is probably uh, the future of unstructured documents uh, to build databases. It can work in multiple languages. It's fine. To do this, however, you need bigger LLMs. So the vector DB works fine, actually. It's not the problem. Uh, we use FICE uh, in, a, in, a, in a big prototype we've developed, and it was fast. What's uh, more problematic today is the LLM. You need something like the mixed whole model, so eight times seven billion parameters, roughly, to get anything meaningful results. So you need, you need that kind of size of models. That kind of size of models need GPU today. So there is TPU and GPU confidential coming. And uh, we have had the chance to test um, a machine with a confidential GPU. Uh, they are very hard to get about, but uh, there are a few, and we are the lucky ones. And I can confirm it works. So uh, if you have confidential CPU and confidential GPUs, latest GPUs, you can already build these kind of applications. So that will offer users the ability, basically, to form their Word uh, document. Uh, or the Google Doc document to be able to query a database of, say, your R&D documents to fill the, the documents you're working on, or the other way around, to actually enrich your vector database with your document because it becomes a reference document. So it will significantly change the way you relate with this kind of tools. Uh, obviously, I've talked about business application, Doc, Sheets. You can do Google Meets as well, encrypted, by the way. Huh? That works as well. Uh, you can do a lot of things already today. Uh, but uh, we also work in banks to secure banking applications exactly the same way we do with Google uh, Workspace. It's exactly the same model, basically. So whether you need confidential AI, and I think you do, uh, I will leave it to Marcus, who has a slide which recaps all that. And, uh, thank you very thank much. You, uh, thank you. <laughs> so I want to finish this off with some practical advice for all of us here. In terms of when you should be thinking of potentially utilizing confidential AI is when either of your data is 
business confidential, it is directly regulated or it is somehow sensitive by whatever means is interesting to you. If you have training sets uh, or models uh, or results that represent intellectual property that you care about that shouldn't fall into wrong hands. Or if you uh, have a model that will be just deployed outside of your control, if it's not on-prem, if it's in the cloud, well, uh, CloudFest after all, um, and does it need to be secured by having this, what I said earlier on, this clear separation of governance on the different parts of your solution stack? And lastly, uh, do you need an auditable record of processing what attestation is for, which I mentioned? It's all of these aspects that should give you uh, an indicator that confidential AI be, may be a control that you could apply in these circumstances. So, to summarize, AI will definitely transform, transform a lot of what we are doing here. And we were seeing that this year versus last year, it's a massive difference in the way how we are uh, dealing with artificial intelligence at this conference already. Also, <clears throat> confidential AI is a great tool to satisfy these privacy uh, regulation, data protection regulation needs. And uh, even when you have just valuable data, it comes in handy. So, if you want to uh, look into that a little bit more, there's a lot to discover on Intel's pages. I hope you think of Intel Confidential Computing uh, in this case, and I hope to that you visit us uh, in our booth where we have a short demo on Confidential AI, where we exactly show uh, the same deployment pattern of a Confidential Virtual Machine a a chatbot running in such an environment on our booth. So, Feel free to come there. Uh, I'll hopefully be there for the rest of the day. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, you mentioned the booth and being able yes. to get a little bit more information there. Uh, what can folks expect with that demo? Well, they, they can expect. In that case, what I was just mentioning, it is a very simple deployment of a uh, Intel AMX enabled chatbot. Uh, if anyone knows our tra Intel Transformer extensions for PyTorch and the neural chat uh, chatbot, that's basically it running in a TDX virtual machine. But we actually have a second demo there that uh, kind of is in not really confidential, but uh, in, in the same way I talked here, but is uh, protecting other aspects like the input um, a data classification, for example, it will check when, whenever uh, uh, you are in, uh, trying to input personal data into the model, into queries, or whether you're trying to manipulate the, the model into saying something wrong or even toxic. Uh, and that demo by Prediction Guard is right next to the other one. It is another aspect of these long lists of regulation requirements that we may potentially have to deal with. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, all.